Hello everyone, and welcome to another read-long. This is your friendly heads-up warning that we are going to be going into a critical reading of Zenith. That means it will not only contain every single spoiler, but if Zenith is one of your favorite books and you cannot stand to see it ripped apart into little tiny pieces, then this isn't the review for you. See you next time. Thanks for playing. Alright, we're back. Yay. We're both like dying because we're both really tired. So this is gonna be great, but we're gonna read Our next after this I don't know how many are gonna have Adam in them for a little while because he's going on a work trip And I'm probably gonna record while he's gone, but we got him today. So that's exciting. We're under chapter 15 Which is from Valen's point of view I believe he was the vengeance will be mine guy. I'm just gonna refer to him as that forever interesting choice here. We're starting out with Valen, who, as you recall, is in some sort of prison, and he's being whipped as you do with this cool electric whip. Uh, and they've described everything in the scene except for, like, pain. Does that make any sense? Like, we're in Valen's point of view, but it's almost like we're looking at him from a distance. And I don't know if that's intentional? It's weird, like, you expect at some point that the pain is going to be described, but it is not. So, I don't know what they're exactly doing with it, but that's just something interesting to think about. We have another, I am Valen Cortas, vengeance will be mine. Take a drink. I don't understand why this chapter is also in italics. So all of his thoughts, his inner monologue, are in, like, regular non-italics? What would you call that? And it feels weird and backwards and I, I don't understand why some of these chapters are in italics. Are they supposed to be in the past? It's really, really not clear. I'm here on a different mic than usual to say that this whole like italics in the past thing is especially rendered unclear because their first chapter slash prologue just told us that we were in the past and was not in italics as I recall so I just don't understand why they're doing this and they can't just tell us like this is in the past. Interesting turn of events. This is a very short chapter but at the end of it old Valen decides you know what I've been being whipped every day for quite a while now. I'm sick of it. And so he just yells for them to stop. Nothing else. He just yells stop. And they do. And apparently that's what they were waiting for. Because then out comes this chick who's heavily described, so I think they either were in love or are going to be in love. She's got like golden ringlets of hair and he thinks about painting her for some reason. And she's got like a, a prosthetic hand where the fingers are claws. I didn't realize it at the time of reading that this is Evil Queen Noor. Uh, I think because the only thing that they seem to have in common description-wise is the prosthetic arm. And she's just like, how's it going? And that's the end of the chapter. And it's like, what? These chapters, these little, like, vignettes don't make any sense. I hope they make sense someday, but are they crucial to the story? I don't know. I'm also very confused that all he had to do this whole time was just yell, stop. Like, he's been being beaten for a super long time every day, and all he had to do was say something. Wouldn't that be a trick? If you could just be like... If you're a prisoner or something, and, and you're just like, you know, I'd like to stop being a prisoner now. And everyone's like, oh, okay, that's what we were waiting for. Off you go, bye, have a good life. We're on to chapter 16, and we're back with Androma. I forget where they were going. <laughs> Do you remember where they were going? No clue. Like, I'm sure they were going to go find a clue to where the hidden general's son is, so. I guess they're headed for the prison moon of Lunamir. Luna Mir, the prison moon. Okay, they're going to a pub which is near the prison moon. And by the way, I'm covered in cats. Cat, cat, cat. <laughs> I don't know why I'm covered in cats right now, but I am. It's like an hour, more than an hour until dinner time, but they start to ramp up the we're here and we want food quite early. See, this is the problem with describing everything with like outer spacey things. Like, Dex is walking with Andy and she's like, the smell was the same as it had always been. Like, Tenebran mountain trees. What the fuck is a Tenebran mountain tree? We have no way to know what that smells like. Presumably like pine, but like, they could smell like poop for all we know. <laughs> I do like, I will give the authors this, I like that both Andy and, what's his nuts, Dex? 
blame each other for like what happened to them like they both think the other one abandoned them back in the day and I like that because it's a little bit deeper than like clearly one of them is the bad guy it's sort of like they both fucked each other over or possibly we'll find out that one of them fucked the other one over more but I like that it's not one-sided there's something you don't need memories of the past since most people can't remember the future and since we have not had it anywhere established that Andy has precognition. <coughs> All you need to say is, memories. The past is implied, as is Nigel's tale. Nigel's tale is more than implied. Yeah. I believe Nigel's tale is implicit. Uh-huh. Nigel's tale is applied. So here's something, and I know probably news doesn't travel super fast. I don't know how big, like, this this galaxy or whatever is that they're flying around in, but... And he is super nervous about going into this bar because it's going to be full of bounty hunters and she's been on, like, the most wanted list since forever. I was like, okay, I can understand that she'd be worried about it. My question is, did the general put out, like, a notice that she is no longer on the most wanted list? Because if he actually wants her to find his kid, mm -hmm. it would seem beneficial to not have bounty hunters chasing her. Now, I'm not saying that every bounty hunter would hear about this. Like, I don't know how well news travels, but it would behoove the general to at least try to make it so people aren't attempting to kill Andy. Don't worry, everyone. She's wearing a hood. No one will recognize her now. This ship has a dash. Like a dashboard. Somehow. I don't know how, like, what is this ship? Like, Dex put his glove, he took his gloves off and put them on the dash. I mean, it's a bridge with enough room for multiple people, but is the pilot section just like literally like a car? Like, Wash, Wash had a dashboard. I guess. He, it's, and maybe it's where she plays with her dinosaurs. This is a fertile land and we will thrive. We will rule over all this land and we will call it this land. So it is implied that Gilly has stuffed the android into a closet somewhere, which is a really good way to have an android uprising on your hands. Like, don't start mistreating the fucking android. And we're on to chapter 17, which is Androma again. By the way, all I can picture is, like, uh, the afterlife from Mass Effect, so... Yeah, for the CD alien bar. Even though this bar is not being described as nearly as flashy or neon, but that, but uh, the afterlife was on a, an asteroid, I believe, and so was this, so gone with it. <laughs> Here's something you don't really need to do. You don't need to be descriptive all the time. There's, there's a time to, to just tell and not show. Uh, when Andy comes into the bar, it says, Andy took note of the exits as they stepped inside. And that's fine. The author then goes on to tell us where all of the exits are, and unless us knowing where the exits are matters later in the scene, <clears throat> we honestly don't need it. Just so you're prematurely critiquing. Maybe it will matter. Maybe it will matter where all of the damn exits are, but I'll... See, if I don't bring this up now, I will forget <laughs> it later. Presumably they're trying to get, like draw attention to themselves, because if not, Dex is just an idiot. Because this bar specifically, we see that all of the patrons are um, war survivors or veterans or whatever. They all had, uh, you know, old injuries from being in that big war that happened. And so, like, and then Dex wanders in, and he's just, like, spreads out his obviously totally intact arms, and is like, oh, I love this place, and... I'm really hoping that he is trying to draw attention to himself because he's very obviously not one of these people. So far everything is going incredibly standard. They found a bar winch and they're bribing her. The whole conversation went exactly as you'd expect. Sad. This is boring to read an exchange that goes exactly the way that you think it's gonna. And now that they've paid her extra, she has nodded towards a dark corner of the room where the person that they are looking for is conveniently sitting. So like, if they had just kept walking around the bar, they might have found her on their own. Like, I thought maybe, you know, the, the bar wench would be like, I know where she is right now. But no, she's in the fucking bar. 
and now Dex has paid this woman money to point at somebody. I point for a living. I mean, that's a pretty sweet gig. Drinking a bar and point. I want to point for a living. Mm. So our main characters could have looked around a little bit more. Especially since Dex knew what this person looked like. He described this person to the bar wench. So it wasn't like he was like, I don't know who I'm looking for. Our main characters are idiots. Or at least Dex is. I'm going forward with the knowledge that Dex is an actual idiot. Andy's like, there are other ways to get information, which I assume she just means, like, hitting. And then Dex laughed so hard she got a glimpse of the chipped tooth at the back of his mouth. So he's doing, like, a full-on Titus from Final Fantasy laugh in the middle of this bar. He's a very strange man. Oh, Dex is sitting on a chair backwards. He's a real badass. Okay, we've switched POVs mid-chapter, and I was not warned. Like, there's a little bit of an extra gap here, but, like, my eye skipped right over that. I wasn't sure why that was there. But it took me a second to realize that we were now in Dex's POV. And I feel like the authors should have just indicated that in some other way, because they've always told us with a chapter break when we were going into someone else's POV. So I don't know why they didn't just, like, tell us we were going into somebody else's. Stars or something. Something, yeah. So she apparently is one of the guards of the of the Lunamere prison, so makes sense that they're going to talk to her. Is this Earth's moon? No. Why is it called Lunamere? I don't know. Because the authors just name things? Is, is the planet Mere? Not to my knowledge. Because then Luna Mere mirrors Luna, maybe. It sounds like Earth's moon. To my knowledge, it is not. I don't think we've... If we did, it was only briefly and I missed it. I don't think we've even mentioned the planet that this moon is orbiting. Hmm. Interesting. It's unimportant. It's a prison moon. That's all you need to know. By the way, Dex has also slept with this woman. So he's now realized that he is literally standing between two women who might have a grudge against him and his dick, which is hilarious to me. I'm imagining like a whole uh, Princess Bride scenario. <laughs> my name is Indigo Matoyas, you killed my father, prepared to die, except it's all about the penis. <laughs> and they just address his dick. I don't really know why we're even watching this scene. I mean, maybe it'll become clear, but you could almost like, so far this chapter, you could literally say, they went to the moon, they got the information they needed, and we would really miss nothing of value. Except for that Dex has, uh, sleeps around, I guess? I mean, eventually they're probably gonna have to, like, leave with a, like, flashbang, and, cause the girls are setting explosives up around the room just in case. Cause in case you need to blow up this bar. I think they're setting up flashbangs, actually. So they can just be like, woo, and get out. But, like, I know it's important to show not tell, but you don't need to show every single thing your characters do. Especially if it's, if it's not really, like, interesting to read. Both Dex and Soina, the girl that he's meeting at the bar, are both, like, hot for Andy. Because Andy is just so dark and so edgy and hot. I don't like when characters are so praising of especially the main character and they're just like, she's so sexy, she is so dark, she is so competent. Like, okay, we get it. You really like your main character. <laughs> you know how much I like I my main now. character. I do now. I do now. This is not going to lead to these two girls kissing, but it really should. Speaking of which, Andy has taken off her hood. So her plan oh, to... Oh, baby. Her take plan, that hood off. plan to remain hidden is completely ruined. Especially since she has, like, special girl hair, so it's, like, white and purple. We're spending a lot of time characterizing... So Yina, and I think she's just going to be a one-off character. We may be being given a little bit of foreshadowing by Soyina. Um, one of the things that she does in her job as a torturer is to torture people to death and then revive them using science. And you have to do it within a three-minute window. And I feel like this might come up later in the book, like, probably Dex is going to die, and then Andy is going to have to, like, get him revived within that window. At least that's my guess, otherwise why would we find this out? Here's an example of a sentence with more words than it needs. She stood up from the table, her chair scraping against the floor as she walked away. No. All you need is she stood up, her chair scraped as she walked away. Or something like that. There's 
too many words. She stood up from the table. From the table is implied she was sitting at a table. Uh, her chair scraped against the floor. Against the floor is implied. What else would it scrape against? Oh, Dex is going to go... Part of, uh, part of Soyena's payment, apparently, is sexy times with him in a disgusting bathroom. So that's where he's going. Great. I mean, I guess, lady, you can do better. I want to tell Soyena that she ought to ask for Andy instead. <laughs> so they're talking about the prison now. Dex has finished with his, his task. Um, and they're talking about the prison. They've got the blueprints. And the torturer chick is like, this, this prison only has two doors. One for prisoners coming in, and one for prisoners going out, meaning the dead bodies. And that just makes me wonder, like, wouldn't they, like, incinerate the bodies? Where do they put them? Do they just, like, I, now I'm picturing a corpse pile at the back of this prison where they just kick these bodies out. What are you doing in my corpse hatch? It also seems kind of unsafe. I mean, I'm sure there aren't codes in space, but it seems kind of unsafe to only have two exits. Like, what if there was a prisoner revolt? You're stuck in there with them. I've got money now that says they're gonna go in the prison through the front door and leave through the dead door, but... They might go in through the dead door and leave through the front door. What do you think, Adam? Well, we've, uh, we've established that they have a friend who makes their living torturing people to death and then resuscitating them. Mm. So it makes sense for them to die and go out the, go dead, out the door dead door and then to be resuscitated. I do feel like these authors have seen Firefly because there are a few things like Dex and his relationship with... Um, the torturer girl reminds me a lot of trying to be like Mal and the woman he married. What was her name? In, uh, in our Mrs. Reynolds. Our Mrs. Reynolds. I don't and know. And then he got back together with her for a heist later, and their relationship in that heist reminds me a lot of Dex's mm. relationship with this girl, this torturer girl. I see. Oh, I have a tower on a moon. What structure would you build on a moon for your prison? Would you make it a tower? I don't think I would make a moon. A prison. The gravity well is too low, it's too easy to make escapes. But there's only two doors, Adam! Only two! Okay, if I was going to have a pr moon prison, it would probably be a pit. A deep, deep, deep Right? Pit. I would put them underground. Like, I would put it into the moon, not sticking up from it. Yeah. I can see a random asteroid. That would be, like, a reasonable prison, especially if you could, like, mask the, in, the goings to and from it. So then somebody comes to the system to try to break them out and they're like, which asteroid is it? <laughs> the walls of this prison are made from unobtainium. And that's not what it's actually called, I'm just calling it that. It's like this super hard substance that you can never tunnel through. By the way, Kinshu, my laptop is right here and Kinshu is behind it and all I can see is like her eyes over the top like this and she's glaring at me. It's, it's hilarious and also kind of unsettling. Oh no, they make the guards take the stairs? There are no elevators in this moon prison, only stairs. Okay, but this is a moon. I suppose, so the gravity's really light, so everybody's like, just like, flying up the taking stairs. Taking the stairs is probably fun. Whee! <laughs> I mean, they're on an asteroid right now, and there's been no mention of gravity being different, so I don't know if we're actually going with that at all. So apparently, our plan is to go in as prisoners and then their friend will give them an hour before she sounds the alarm that they have escaped. This sounds like the worst plan ever, but okay. Oh, they dumped them in space. Okay, we find out what happens to the corpses. They dump them in space. So, presumably, there's just corpses floating around this moon. It seems like such a waste. I suppose once tech gets sufficiently advanced, but you could decompose that, into, and then you could have a farm on the moon, and then you wouldn't have to import food to the people. Yeah, it would seem smart to, like... Th this prison doesn't seem very cost-effective, especially since you're torturing and reviving people over and over again. Like, you have to keep sending in food and stuff for your guards, for your prisoners. Like, it's inefficient. Andy's being awfully judgy of a woman who tortures for a living when Andy, like, laughs as she murders people. I keep forgetting that Andy has to wear these special cuffs on her wrists, or her wrists literally, like, fall apart. And I think I assume her hand falls off. <laughs> so, they're talking about Valen now, so it is, we are indeed going after Vengeance Will Be Mine Valen. And the, the torturer lady is like, 
he's easily broken, yet he's never died on me. And that just, that just makes me chuckle that, like, she's, she's like, well, he's kind of a wussy, but he's never died, so I guess he's pretty cool. This is redundant. This was too easy, too simple. Oh, I hate this. As they're about to leave, torturer lady, Soina, leans down to Andy and whispers that Dex wouldn't have sex with her after all because he's still in love with Andy. I don't like it. Except Soyenya. Yeah. She's cool. She kills people to death. Yeah, she kills him right to death and then brings him back to kill him to death again. And I wish she was going to be a recurring <laughs> character. I, I actually want her book. She seems really interesting. And we haven't gotten any stupidly painful flashbacks of her life or how awesome she is. Why you gotta do this book? Why you gotta be so cliched and be like, but he loves Andy, so he could never have sex with this other woman. And it's like, he could. Him and Andy are not like dating right now. You're, you're allowed to have sex with, with multiple people in your life. I hate it. And of course, Andy's like, that doesn't mean anything. What? Okay, you're gonna keep pretending that him, like, deciding not to have sex with this other girl and basically straight up saying that he still has feelings for Andy is, like, that doesn't mean shit, though. This section is all cliché all the time. And now they are doing a kiss, which is presumably to signal the girls to, like, set off the flashbangs, but I don't know why. It seems like they could just walk out of this bar and everything would be fine. I'm very confused. But we're gonna stop here, because this book is hurting me. I don't understand why I'm so bored by this. I just, I don't really feel any of these characters except for the one-off character that we met in this chapter. This whole bar scene felt really cliched. We could have skipped right to the part where they were talking to their contact, like we didn't need to have that whole ridiculous lead up of asking the barmaid who then just pointed to somebody in the corner. And then Dex, being like, okay, I'm gonna go sleep with her as part of her payment. Never mind, I can't sleep with her because I'm too in love with Andy. It's about space pirates. It should be interesting. I was expecting <laughs> battles or excitement or something. There's not even politics in it. There's, it's just bleh. But we'll see you either in a few seconds or in the next video, whenever this one happens to be. All right, we're back with some more chapters of this really quite boring book. Um, but hey, we're, we're, we're moving, we're making some progress, oh boy, you guys are very patient with me and how slow I read this. Chapter 19, it's from the point of view of Nor, I forget who that is, is that the girl? Like the one who killed all of her competition in the previous chapter? The Evil Queen, is it Nor, or is Nor the other one? No, uh -huh. neither of us remember, it might be the Evil Queen, it's either the, e either the Evil Queen or the girl who killed all of the others so that she could be something. Or maybe they're both, maybe they're the same person. I don't know, because these chapters are just jump around so much. So Noor had a bad dream and she wakes up next to a guy, Zan, Zan, whatever, and he's all like, it'll be okay, and then he goes and he opens the curtains and then she calls him back and uh, it says, he trotted back to bed, then pulled her to him. He trotted, he was like, I just picture him being like, coming dear, doop, 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 doop. Trotted, huh? Okay, very sexy. Apparently Zan is her bodyguard, so sexy. There are too many characters in this book and I'm reading the chapters too far apart. I'm getting very confused. And I think I might even be confused even if I was reading these much closer together because there are too many characters, too many points of view. This book needs to narrow its focus. At least for me. I don't know. A lot of sci-fi books do have like multiple points of view and that kind of thing. <clears throat> Is that more common in sci-fi? So it's, it's very common in space operas, which has been... Like, so I haven't made a study of this, so I'm speaking a little bit out of my ass here. Uh, but there was a good chunk of time from, like, 90s to 2010 or 2000 to 2010 where, like, space operas were the thing in sci-fi. Uh, and, yeah, in space operas you got multiple POVs because you've got, like, each book is a thousand pages and you're, exp you're spanning so much stuff. And, like, Dune, a lot of people that replicated Dune, I feel Dune had a lot of POVs as well, having never read the full series. Um, but that is not necessarily a common thing in all of sci-fi. 
Crash or Snow Crash uh, is a book, and it's pretty much one POV for the whole point as a sci-fi. That was pretty popular. Uh, the Three Body Principle, I think, three is body problem. Problem. Thank you. Um, is multiple POVs, but if I recall correctly, it's like part one, one POV. Part two, a second POV. Um, this book right here is. Um, I'll move it over so they can see it. Uh, <laughs> is primarily Rosemary's POV and very occasionally some of the other crew. And it's kind of like it's uh, just enough of the crew to foreshadow what's about to happen. This brings to the question what makes a space opera? Because if a space opera is accepted to be able to have lots of points of view, would this qualify as a space opera? You're a professional, Adam, tell me. So, I think it wants to be a space opera, but I don't think it would... Well, it might not even want to be a space opera. Right now, it's very tight, and it's all dealing with people dealing with each other. This one? Yeah. Okay. Is, is what it seems. Tight as in, like, fam relationships tight, not necessarily as tightly written. Um, and whereas, like, a space opera might, like... The people may never interact with each other. And in fact, many of the space operas I read are like 7 to 11 books. And maybe by book 10 or 11, the things the people have been working on separately long, long ago will start coming together and be like, oh, these are why these people are important. But you had books and books where they were on different continents, planets, solar systems, whatever, and had nothing to do with each other, didn't even hear news reports about what was going on. Maybe. Because it's all part of a much larger story. And you and you get to see little snippets of the larger story from each of their narrow perspectives. I think that's maybe what this book is missing is the larger story. It <clears throat> keeps hinting about like this war and things that happened in the past, leaving people scarred and stuff, but it doesn't feel like there's a larger story now. This isn't set to the backdrop of the war, it's set to the backdrop of the war already happened and people are pretty pissed about it. And there's no, like, at least yet, and it's, I mean, by now you probably know, there's no really big overarching other plot, so it's just this heist to, like, steal this guy who is a general's son. And we just are getting so many different characters that I'm sure will be important later, but do we need them now? I don't know. I don't think so. It was really interesting. I'm gone off on a tangent because it's, I don't want to keep reading. Um, <laughs> uh, there was I went to a panel at Wiscon. Check out my Wiscon video if you're interested. That was a uh, writing um, ensemble cast and writing multiple POVs. And all the people on the panel were people who loved to write multiple POVs. And it was really interesting for me as someone who does not love to write multiple POVs to listen to them talk about how much they love to do it and how it would be so difficult to just stick to one and everything and this doesn't really have a point it was just interesting to hear like that such a different angle from how my brain works and like how do you decide which POVs to keep which POVs to focus on at which time like there's so much stuff you have to think it's about. about to get inappropriate <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the ferret is doing terrible things. Is that a ferret in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me? Abby. Yeah, if you hear weird noises, of course it's pet sounds, but you guys know that by now. Abby, the terrible ferret is here to be a ping. Yay! Because they ain't claw my junk. Do you want to go back for more? You're going to go attack daddy's poor unmentionables more? <laughs> now she's going to dig in the couch. That's fine. All right, I suppose I have to go back to reading this book. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh my goodness. The more I read for these read-alongs, the more I appreciate The Savior's Champion. Now, maybe it's just because it was the first one I read and I'm starting to remember it fondly. And if I, re <laughs> if I reread it now, I would go back to thinking it was terrible. But, like, at least there was only one point of view. At least the story moved sometimes. With this chapter, we're finding out that the queen has these bad dreams, and she only lets one person comfort her, and that's her bodyguard and lover, Zan. And it's like, that's cool and all. Are we trying to humanize her so that later when she's like the villain, where she's not quite the villain, you know? She's a deep villain? Because I don't care about her at all. Give me a reason to care about her. Is her love interest going to die? Is that going to like...
trigger her to be vicious later on. They're really hitting heavily how much she like only confides in him, only gets her comfort from him. So I'll be very surprised if he doesn't die. Is this the queen? The evil queen, yeah. So the thing is, is uh, they their lover is playing the long game and waiting till they have their fingers in enough range of authority, and then they are going to kill the queen and assume the mantle of authority. Mm. That would be cool. I seriously doubt that's going to happen, but... Uh, they'll probably fail, and then the queen will be horribly betrayed by their lover and trust no one and go on an even eviler rampagier thing. <laughs> and we're on to chapter 19. These next several chapters are like two to three pages long. We're back with Dex. Dex the idiot. Who just... Things just happen to work out for him. So he's an idiot, but for some reason it happens to work out. So maybe he's got really good dice rolls. Put all their stats into luck. Yeah. So their plan is to start a bar fight in this <laughs> bar full of guards from the prison. And that's how they're going to, like, this maximum security prison. People who start a bar fight, even in a room full of prison guards... Would they really get sent to the maximum security prison? Wouldn't resources be better spent to just, like, slap them on the wrists and send them on their way? Alternately, wouldn't people spend their time catching Andy, because now she's, like, right out in the open, and turning her in for some profit? I don't understand. Also, we're in Dex's point of view, so he will not stop just wanking on about how sexy Andy is when she's, like, causing mayhem. Oh, and their, their plan to start the bar fight is to have Andy and all of her crew pretend that Dex is sleeping around with all of them, and they're furious about it. Because this book does not have enough cliches yet. <laughs> Couldn't they start the bar fight by pretending that Dex is there to capture Andy or something, you know? Instead, it's just like, we're jilted lovers here to punish you, penis haver. In this random bar on this tiny asteroid full of prison guards. Also, even though Dex is an idiot, I'm not a huge fan of this scene where the girls are just beating the shit out of him to go, you know, with their plan. They're not pulling punches, they're just beating the crap out of him. And I'm not a huge fan of that. Like, we're supposed to be like, yeah, Dex is an asshole, kick the crap out of him, but it's like, why? But we've switched POVs, I think, to Andy's again with very little warning. But now she's admiring how sexy Dex is as he gets into the bar fight because one of the girls threw him right into the middle of a table of a bunch of guards who are playing a card game. Howled is being used a lot in this, and I don't think it's necessarily being used well. Like, you want to be careful with words like howled to use them very sparingly, but a lot of people in this bar fight are howling. And somehow Andy got a hold of meat cleavers. So I don't know. She just has them now. Oh, we're going to be switching POVs fast and furious now. Not a fan. Like, it's just, like, paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. That is something that I think does show a little bit of amateur, like, Ness. I don't know too many professionals who do the paragraph, paragraph, paragraph switch. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Maybe you know of that. But, like, at that point, why not just have an omniscient narrator or just stick with one and just not know what, what is going through your too many characters' heads every second of the scene? Wait a minute. Dex has green blood? I read the sentence three times. Is he an alien? I never got the idea that he was an alien. Is he a Vulcan? I don't understand. Did I just miss it? I don't remember it ever saying that he was an alien. Unless Andy is an alien too, is her blood also green? I am so confused right now. So, Andy is very confusing. We just had a paragraph where she was like, yeah, er, bloodshed, I love it, I'm the bloody baroness. And then in this one, she's like, oh, we should leave before the flashbangs go off. And then she sees that Dex is still fighting and his blood is green. And, and she's like, now she's like annoyed that, that she wants to stay and fight. Like, she's like, oh, the bloody baroness never turned away from a fight. With a sigh, she pushed herself forward, swinging her borrowed knives. Like, she's bored now? A paragraph ago, she was like, yeah, it's blood, go rah. Then we're on to chapter 20 with Claren, year 18. Don't remember which one Claren was. So, there were a lot of towers and glass in this book. It almost feels like the authors couldn't decide if they wanted to write a sci-fi or a fantasy. Because, like, everywhere we go, like, towers and things made of glass and gems are present. 
the architecture in this entire galaxy is, is towers and glass. This is an awkward sentence. So, Claren, who is a person, uh, has, and she seems to be a royal of some kind, has like a, an advisor, and she's describing that like half his face is melty. Bits of metal held together his flesh. Wouldn't normal people say his flesh was held together by bits of metal? That's the kind of sentence I write before I go back in and try to fix it all. So maybe it was just missed. Okay, or maybe this person just thinks like Yoda because the next sentence is a gruesome creature, Darai was. By the way, I figured out this girl is the one who killed all the other girls so she would become the only yielded. We still don't know what that means, but apparently that makes her like a princess or something. Aha! All right. She is a potential bride for the king and uh, that's maybe what that means? Like, I don't know. Is this like Nor earlier when she had a different name? Possibly, because it's all in italics again, which might mean it's in the past, although again, unclear what italics mean. Pretty sure that she plans to kill the king and take over, so this might be past evil queen Nor. Chapter 21, we are from Lyra's point of view, Lyra being the second in command. I think we got her point of view once before. Don't know why we need it, but we got it. We're back at the bar, obviously, and Gilly's homemade flashbangs have, like, had, like, they were too potent, so now, like, people are exploded. Exploded. Well, apparently the pub also belonged to the warden of the prison, and now they have bloated up, so now they're definitely going to the prison. I don't think the plan was to blow it up. I think that it was just supposed to be, like, flashbangs, shock and terror after the bar fight, but, like, if the plan was to blow up the bar, they didn't need a bar fight. I feel like the authors could have thought a little bit longer about this whole scene, this whole bar plan, and found ways to make it more engaging, less cliched, and, and the plan to be less ridiculous. This book needs to stop reminding me that Andy has metal cheeks for no reason. Seconds after they've blown up the pub, the warden and a bunch of other guards are here, so it's like they were just like waiting outside to be like, gee, I hope someone blows up my pub today. We have another howled, and also, I don't understand, like, okay, they started a bar fight, they blew up the pub, the warden is here, they have stood in front of the warden and admitted that they blew up the pub and injured all of her guards who were inside of it, and they're still antagonizing her further, like Dex is being all like, hey warden, want to sleep with me, and Andy just took one of the guard's guns and shot him in the knee, and it's like, why? I think you have achieved it, you don't need to go further. Yeah, and it turns out that the exits to the pub don't matter because the Andy's crew, who are, are going to leave while Andy and Dex get taken in, just leave through a hole that got blown in the side of the pub. So, like, we didn't need to know where the exits were at the beginning, after all. Like, okay, you want to you wanna get across that your character is planning enough to find the exits. Okay, you can say that. But then you don't need to describe where all the exits are unless they're important. You can use those words describing something else in the pub to help us get a better vision of it. I think they were important, so at this point you realize they couldn't get to them and they had to blow a hole through the wall. But they didn't have to blow a hole through the wall, it just so happened that there was a hole in the wall after their makeshift flashbangs exploded the whole place. There was no mention of not being able to get to the exits. They just left through a handy hole in the wall. And then we spent several paragraphs with Lyra, upset that she has to leave her captain behind, even though that was the plan. So like... I get that you're upset, but like, why are you dragging your feet so hard? Like, this is exactly the plan. It's a terrible plan, it's a stupid plan, but so far everything has gone along with your stupid plan. And I'm gonna stop here, and I'll probably be back wearing the same clothes because I'll probably film more today, but I'm um, gonna take a little break because I need it. Hey everyone, it's that time again. Time to shout out my patrons. Lennox, Amanda, Thelia, Jenny, Joseph, Kim, Lisa, Sabby Panda, Sam, Sarah, Savvy, and Scribbling Cat. I thank you all so much for being my patrons. You guys rock.